Zelda. How are you? Well, you're coming on, so I had to put my glasses on to raise my cool factor today. Oh, you I come love it on the show. Great. I love those. Wow. <laughs> okay, Zelda. First of all, I'm so happy you're here doing this. Um, and I kept texting your mom. You think she'll do it? <laughs> She's like, yeah, ask her. I'm like, you ask her. <laughs> But, uh, well, I'm so honored. So thank you so much. I mean, you're doing you and your sister both are just like tearing up the world right now, which is so awesome to be a witness to and to see where you guys came from, little bitty babies and children to oh. where you're now. <laughs> it's awesome. Hello, and welcome to At the Podium with me, Patrick Huey. At the Podium is a multimedia platform that brings together people from a diverse background of lives, careers, and experiences who all share one thing in common. They have stepped fully into the transformative power of finding and raising their voices to make an impact on the world we live in today. At the Podium holds a space for everyone to share their stories, to be heard, and to bring us inspiration. Today, I'm thrilled to share the podium with Zelda Adams. Zelda Adams grew up in New York City, Topanga Canyon, California, and the Catskill Mountains, Roscoe, New York. At age six, she began making feature films alongside her family under the banner of Wonder Wheel Productions, often referred to as Adams Family Films. A recent recipient of numerous production and acting awards across the indie film circuit, her latest film, Hellbender, shares the top spot on Rotten Tomatoes' list of the best horror films of 2022, and you can catch it on Shudder. She's also been operating the camera since she was nine and is now writing, directing, shooting, and editing her own short films and music videos. She was commissioned by Condé Nast, to create videos for their hashtag Make It Vogue TikTok campaign and has begun modeling for brands like Gucci, Louis Vuitton, Polo, Fury, and Marc Jacobs. She played drums in the band Kid California with her dad and sings lead vocals in Hellbender. Z will be starting college in fall 2022 at Columbia University. Okay, Zelda, welcome to At The Podium. Thank you so much for having me. I just, I feel so honored. So I'm really appreciative. Thank you. I'm, I'm so happy that you're here today. And as we were discussing earlier, um, I actually haven't seen you in person since I think you were maybe 10, nine years old when you and your mom and your sister were traveling through the U.S. <laughs> it was your first movie I think you guys were shooting. You were traveling through the U.S., you went to every state, right? Just about, 49 states. You went to 49 states, and we met up in Miami on South Beach and had lunch, dinner, I don't remember now, at a restaurant on South Beach. And I have not seen you in person since then, so it's amazing to see you <laughs> virtually, at least today. I remember that was fun meeting up there. I don't remember what we did, but I just remember seeing you and thinking it was so cool. But it's been nice seeing you on Instagram. You know, oh my gosh. <laughs> <laughs> and your Instagram is beautiful. It's so, so beautiful. Thank you. <laughs> awesome. And you know, I was thinking as I was reading your bio, um, the one thing that is not on there is that you are an amazing soccer player. Like you played really competitively when you were in high school and junior high school? I, I did. I played soccer for, you know, maybe like over 10 years. I started when I was like four and that was like majority of my life. I was like, sorry, I can't hang out. I have soccer practice. I can't go to your birthday party. I have a tournament. Like, <laughs> life. And you were, you were so, so good at it. And then the other thing that I think was really beautiful about your bio is that you are really, really what we would call a multi-hyphenate. You're doing so many things within in your life right now. And you actually just won the award for best actress at the, it was the Fantasia International Film Festival. And what they said of your work, Zelda, they said, I'm gonna read it. They said, the power in her performance and her overwhelming presence confirm the award 
for this young actress. The award for best actress goes to Zelda Adams, main character of Hell Bender. And we should also note that your dad, John, won the award at the same festival for best score. So what was that like for you to win that type of accolade? I was, I'm still in shock, to be honest, because Fantasia is such an incredible film festival that I was just so honored to even like be in the festival with our film, but to win an award, I was just blown away. They were so kind to do that for me, but I wasn't shocked that John won best score because that was well-deserved. He worked so hard on that score, so I was so happy for him. The music in the movie is quite beautiful, and you just released a side A and side B, which I was listening to, and I was like, the vibe in the music is so beautiful, Zelda. And you wrote that music. Yeah, so uh, John, Toby, and I, we all make the music together. John really produces it and writes most of it. I helped with some of the writing. But, um, and then Toby and I and Lulu sing on it. So it's a real Adams Family music production. Right. I mean, if, if you think about it, Zelda, you and your family have been filmmakers for over a decade now, and you've made some truly beautiful movies. I mean, even the frightening ones. I mean, the, the cinematography of Hellbender is, is stunning. Um, but there was something about Hellbender, I think, that really captured people. And I wonder what you think that was. Why do you think that this film has really been such a big success? It's on Shudder and it's resonated with so many different people. Why do you think that happened? Well, first of all, thank you so much for saying that. But, you know, we worked really hard on making sure that Hellbender was a really exciting and thrilling horror film. But we also wanted to make sure that it was abundant with beauty and a really good narrative, which Toby really worked hard on. She is a great writer. Um, but I think what the audience really resonated with was how many parallels there are in Hellbender to the world that we've been living in the past couple of years. You know, we started filming it when COVID started, and that was a time when many people, including myself, were stuck in isolation. And in that time, you know, we were kind of forced to learn a lot more about ourselves and our identity and where we came from. And our main character, Izzy, is going through that as well. You know, she's discovering more about her identity and her heritage. So I feel like that really gave something for the audience to relate to. But, you know, Izzy's story is a little bit more violent than the rest of ours, at least I hope. <laughs> right. Throughout your career in making these movies and you talk about the, the sort of violence and the, the darkness of Izzy's life in Hellbender but you played these characters throughout all of these movies that have some pretty intense histories some pretty intense moments in these movies and I remember asking Toby your mother you know how they approach that with you and Lulu your sister because when you first started you were both very very young and dealing with some very mature and sophisticated content and subjects. And I wonder how you enter that space as an actress, as an artist, and you've been doing it ever since you were a very young girl. So what, what, what's happening internally with you when you start going into these very complex, complicated spaces that are the worlds of your movies? It, it's funny. People ask me if, you know, playing these violent characters in these horror movies is hard and takes a toll on me but I'm going to be completely honest and say it it hasn't really affected me at least knock on wood not so far maybe it's just because I'm a horror fanatic and I just love the genre so much that I think it's thrilling but I know that it's not real and just that horror is a really great gateway into you know telling a great metaphor you know you're still telling a, a true story um, a great narrative, but you're just covering it in blood. And I think that horror can be a fun avenue for people to see a story like that. Mm -hmm. You just described horror as an avenue, as a gateway and a metaphor. Is that why you think the genre is so popular? I mean, right now, horror movies are everything. Yeah, they are popping off right now. And I definitely think that there's a reason for it. You know... My parents like to say, you can cry through life, you can 
or you can laugh through life. And I think sometimes with horror, you can laugh through it. Like with a jump scare, you're like, oh my God, that was horrifying, but funny. You know, I, and so I think horror is a great way to just tell a story and spread a spread an idea across. And I think people are just excited and exhilarated by it. When you were a little girl starting off on this journey, what did you think? Because here you were living your life and all of a sudden you guys are in an RV driving across the US trying to figure out how to make these movies. What what was happening internally in your mind for for yourself? Were you game to go or were you like, I want to go back to soccer practice? Like, <laughs> <laughs> you know, because it's such an unusual life. And I wonder what was your perspective on it? Because I asked Toby when I interviewed her and she was like, you'd have to ask Lulu and Zelda what they thought. So I have you. So what did you think? Because it's such, and I know maybe it isn't unusual for you because it's been your life. It's what you know, but it's not a sort of traditional route of growing up that, that young kids have. I, you know, it's funny. I was six years old when my parents asked me, hey, you know, do you want to make a movie and just travel in an RV around America, you know, making this film? And I was like, uh, yeah, because I had just watched um, Twilight and Breaking Dawn. And I was like, oh, my God, I want to be Bella. I want to be, you know, a famous actress, Hollywood, all this. So, of course, I was totally down. You know, did I become Bella from Twilight, a Hollywood actress? No, but... It, it was cool because I discovered something totally better, you know, independent filmmaking. And I discovered a part of filmmaking that I really loved. You know, I when I started when I was six years old, I was just interested in acting. But now I've learned, oh, wow, you know, I really love the cinematography aspect of filmmaking. So it brought me to an entirely new place. But from the beginning of, of it all, I was really excited. And I think I still am. When you go to Columbia in the fall, are you studying film, right? Yeah, I'm going to be studying film, and I'm I'm really excited for that. It's going to be really different from the way I've been making films the past 12 years. Yeah, I mean, you're, you're probably going to have more experience than a lot of the people coming in who are going to be your classmates. <laughs> we'll see. I don't know. You know, I like to say that the way we've been making films is very cavewoman style. We're working with the little amount of resources that we have, you know, a small camera, a broken tripod. And I'm going to be walking into these facilities with like huge cameras I can't even pronounce. So <laughs> I'm going to have a lot to learn. <laughs> oh. Something else about your life growing up that was really unique, I think, was that you and your dad, um, John, who was a musician also, back in the day, he had a band called Banana Fish, way back in the day, when we were all living in New York together. And you started a band with him called Kid California, and you were traveling and playing in clubs through New York and Texas in this band with him. You were playing the drums, I believe, correct? Yes, I was, yeah. What, what was that like for you? It was really, really fun. I started playing drums, yeah, when I was super young, and my dad, you know, raised me on music. He raised me on his punk and rock and roll songs, and he asked me, hey, Z, like, you want to be in a band together? And I was like, hell yeah, of course I do. So, <laughs> you know, we just started playing, and it was funny because um, we covered a lot of his old songs, which were about drugs and sex and all that, and I was just laying down a fat beat in the background, like, hey, this is fun. But... You know, we released some music on YouTube, made some music videos, and we even got to play live in some places, like in the city and in and in Victoria, Texas. So that was really cool. I mean, you you've traveled the U.S. You've made you've been a filmmaker. You've been a writer, a musician. You traveled playing music. What what have you learned about yourself in this process? I I think it's taught me a lot about what I love to do and where I'm happiest and also where I want to see myself in the future. Um, you know, this recent year of traveling and homeschooling when I was 17, we were traveling in a little trailer during COVID. So we were, you know, safely isolated, but able to still see the world. And it just taught me, wow, you know, I want to be making films. I 
I want to be surrounded by people that are into art and music and films. So it, it, it did tell me, wow, maybe, you know, this next year, once I graduate, I want to be in New York City because I'll be surrounded just like by a melting pot of people and activities. And how was your homeschooling experience? I know, again, a very, not uncommon now, many people are homeschooled, but still the majority of kids are going to either a public or a private school. What was that homeschooling experience like for you? Toby was a fantastic teacher. She really invested herself in the process. You know, she made learning about grammar fun. We would be, you know, doing grammar lessons and lessons about like native history while we would actually be looking at these like monumental places in, in real life. Um, and my dad was a pretty cool PE teacher. <laughs> you know, I did soccer with him. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't even think about that until you just said it. Like the things that most kids just read in the books about, you were actually driving to those sites and seeing them in 3D in person. I remember, you know, John and Toby were teaching Lulu and me about Geronimo. And then we were at one of his monuments I don't remember which one, but it was just so cool being there, seeing it in person. Wow, yeah. You traveled the country. You, you've seen almost every state. And I wonder, what is your view? What did that experience teach you about America and being an American? I would say that all the traveling around the states has taught me that I'm happy to be living here in America. You know? We most definitely have a lot of room for improvement, but traveling across the country, you know, you see a lot of notions of hatred and things that aren't good, but more often than that, you see beautiful land and you get to be an observer of people all across the world just embracing their land and their own story and their families, which I think is really cool. Mm. Um, and I've learned that it's good to be super grateful to be able to go camp on the coast of Oregon or, you know, learn about your history by looking at this monument of Geronimo. Um, so I'm really grateful for that. And America has a lot of treasures that I appreciate that we can embrace. You in your life have lived through some of the most greatest political and social struggles we've ever lived through in the modern era, maybe in the history of the country. You know, we had the election of 2016. We had COVID, George Floyd, January 6, 2021. And I wonder how those really monumental events have shaped you and your views of the world. It's funny because it made me question a lot about what I was just saying about how beautiful America is. You know, I, I saw how vicious people could be and how there could just be a huge fall in humanity and our government. So there was a period where I was, you know, lacking hope and was just feeling, you know, bad about everything that was going on. But I realized that that wasn't doing anything for, you know, the state of our nation. So I think it's really important to, you know, strive for equality and success. And I think that means embracing the people in our community that are trying to do good for our country instead of, you know, just trying to throw fuel onto the fire. Um, I, I went to a school that, you know, it's in a small rural town, it's quite conservative. And when I first moved there, I was like, oh my God, I don't know if I can handle this. But after a while, I realized, you know what? I think that we all can learn from each other just by, um, you know, talking civilly and, you know, connecting on common ground, you know? We, I think that we all became better humans by, uh, you know, playing soccer together and doing art together. And I think that's the way that we all can evolve into better people. It's interesting that you say that, Zelda, because I grew up in a very small town in Texas where we all were in school together from elementary, junior, and high school. We were all together through all those years. So it was a very small town. And you know, I'm sure I grew up with people who had political and social differences than what I grew up with, because that's just the nature of being human. People have different perspectives and different ideas about how this world should work and what should be. But it, it never impacted our relationship. 
It never impacted our ability to play soccer on the field, as you said, to to come together. And I think that that still gives me hope. That still gives me hope about the country is that we do have that. We still all we still share the identity of American, of human, of person. And I think that's still hopeful for us. I totally agree with you. And I think that you worded it really, really well. And when you were in high school in 2020, you joined a group and it was called SARE, Stand Against Racism in Education. And I wonder what is the work of this group and and how did how did you become a member of this particular organization? I wanted to help in any way that I could. So I felt that by listening or participating in any sort of protest started by this group, I felt that I could do that. So it was an anti-racism group in my community with members that went to or go to, you know, the local schools in my district. And I thought it was a really good form of action because we could work on education initiatives on a small scale, which I think is one of the most important ways of making change, just on really small scales, like in the classroom. I haven't had a person on the show who's really where you are in your life right now. So I think your perspective on, on, on these things is really important for us to hear and really important for us to learn from. And I wonder what your, your views are on race relations right now, on the political situation that we find ourselves in, on how, we, how we're trying to make space and wrestle through how do we deal with transgender youth and how do we deal with LGBTQ youth? How do we deal with non-binary youth? And I wonder if you could just take a moment and reflect on what your thoughts are on those issues. I think that we have a lot of work to do as a society, you know, to help the, you know, as you said, you know, not mainstream people feel more included in our society. And I tend to get scared about, you know, the rights of trans and queer people, especially in the stance of the Supreme Court right now. But like what I was saying earlier, I think working on a small scale is really the best for fighting for equality and representation, whether that means, you know, supporting the people that need it most in these communities. And, but I think mostly just treating every person that comes your way with kindness and doing everything you can to make them feel heard and seen. Because I think sometimes it can be really hard, especially if you are, you know, a non-binary trans person to sometimes feel that way. So if you're someone that can make them feel, you know, loved and heard, that's the most important thing you can do. Mm. And when you, and when you, when you see the political back and forth and the sort of, the sort of rancor that happens between these different groups, does that seem foreign to you? Because I have, I ask that because I have a perception that the sort of wars and battles that we're fighting right now, hopefully may not have the same weight with your generation because you're growing up in a time with way more access to information. You're probably also growing up with a broader scope of what the world looks like because you've traveled, you've read, you've gone and seen. So how do you view that conversation when, 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 it, when it gets to those fever pitches? That's a good question. It's funny because I feel like I've been raised in a place where it's it's totally okay to be gay or trans or anything. So it sometimes is a little foreign to me when I see people of, you know, older generations or really conservative views fighting about this. I'm like, what's the issue? Like, it's so, you know, normal to me. So it can, it can sometimes feel a bit alien when people are fighting over something that just, I, I don't even question it. If mm. I- yeah, it, it does make sense. It's, you know, it's it's funny because, you know, it's it's kind of like when I was growing up and people would talk about, I'm a little bit older than you, but um, it's it's it was not remarkable to me after a certain point to see interracial couples. And for my parents' generation, that was a big deal. And I and I and I hope that perhaps as we continue to evolve and develop and grow and learn to understand, and as you said earlier, see each other as humans. Um that the things that are sort of ripping us apart right now might not have the weight when you're 51. Right, yeah. And you've also grown up in a time 
where the, I think the stresses on your generation are just completely unimaginable to my generation. I mean, the worst thing I had growing up was a slam book where people write bad things about you in a book, but it wasn't published online. It wasn't <laughs> broadcast for the world to see. And I wonder how you, in the in this time that you're in, deal with the 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 stresses of identity and image and the pressure to look and be a certain way, given the true impact of, of social media. Yeah, I mean, during COVID, I definitely started to look into others, other people's lives on social media, you know, socially, physically and all that. Mm -hmm. And I won't deny that I didn't get a little self-conscious or jealous or try to, you know, reflect myself compared to other people I saw on Instagram or whatever. And hell, I, I sometimes still even do this. But I, I really try to remind myself that we are all just showing the best parts of ourselves on Instagram. I'm doing it too. So <laughs> right. I just want to, you know, ground myself and remember that everything online is so posed and so fake. And on a modeling level too, it's really easy to, you know, reflect yourself compared to what you're seeing in front of you. But I sometimes, you know, feel like, oh, okay, I don't look like the people represented on social media. But then I remember what has helped me a lot is thinking, you know, what? I can be the represent the representation that I want to see. So maybe someone else that's having these same insecurities will see me too and feel comforted by that. Yeah. And I wonder, because you, you just mentioned your modeling life that you're building and I said you come by it honestly because your 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 dad was a very successful model and your acting, your mom was a, a great actress, is a great actress still. I wonder within the world of modeling, how you keep yourself grounded because it's a tough business and it's not it's not a business for weak people, that's for sure. And it's and it's not a business that's known for, you know, handing out candy to people. And so I wonder how you keep yourself focused and not buy into the chatter that's all around the modeling industry. Both of my parents have been really helpful in keeping me grounded and reminded that this industry can be, you know, very materialistic, but it's it can be very finite. And it's good to remember that and to not change yourself for what you think people want to see. You know, stay true to yourself because, you know, I think that just adds to my story as a model and as an artist, which, you know, is really helpful. Um, and I think it can, it can just be really hard, yeah. But I think what is m most important is, you know, my happiness as a person and as a result of that, I think I'll be the best model and best, you know, kind of representation. You know, I I talk to my my the friends, my friends' children who are your age or, or close to your age, and there is there is an idea that I sense in all of you is that your lives are going to be bigger than just the particular job or the particular career you may choose to have, and that even that career may shift and change over time. I mean, if you look at yourself. You know, you started in the entertainment industry when you were six. That was 12 years ago. And you've had already so many iterations of what you were able to do, what you've experienced. And I wonder if that is the way of the future with what we call Gen Z, but with, with the younger generation that is coming up right now. I, I'm honestly really inspired by, by my generation, you know kids are turning something like TikTok into something extremely creative and cool. You know, people are turning a 15 second video into uh, entrepreneurship. And, you know, I think that's just really inspiring that you can turn, you know, a silly little video into your own business. Mm. And I think it'd be cool if, you know, I could do that someday. I, I'm really inspired. What was, what was it, the, the make it, was it the Make It Happen campaign or Make It Vogue campaign right, yeah. on TikTok? Yeah, I was I was invited um, through my modeling agency. They hooked me up with Vogue when they were doing this launch of hashtag Make It Vogue, mm. where they were hiring youth uh, creators to make like a little series on TikTok. So it's so cool that they were reaching out to young artists like me to make videos. I, I think. That's really great that a big, you know, brand like Vogue is doing that for young creators. Mm. 
Zelda, when you were six and we were having lunch or dinner or whatever we were having with your family in Miami uh, those many years ago, could you imagine the life that has unfolded for you? You know what? I don't think so. I. It's funny. The other day, I was doing a modeling job right across the street from where I grew up on Hudson and Jane Street. And I was like, you know what? Living in this apartment all those years ago, I wouldn't have ever guessed this was the story that I'd be living right now. I probably thought, you know, oh, I'm going to be in the World Cup being a, a professional soccer player. And you know what? That would have been really cool. But one of the great things about life is that it's always changing. So I'm excited to see where I'll be 20 years from now. It might be a totally different story. And that was my next question. What, what do you see for yourself? I mean, and what, what you know, your 18-year-old self, your 19-year-old 19 19 self, what do, you, what do you dream about? You know what? I, I don't have a specific dream, and I actually kind of like it that way. Mm. I think that's how I've gotten to where I am now is just by saying yes to cool opportunities you, of course saying yes to you know safe and healthy things um but you know at six years old saying yeah i want to act in a film that sounds really fun mom and dad oh yeah i want to play soccer oh yeah i i want to try modeling so i think i'm really excited to see what other yes opportunities come my way mm. and i think going to school is going to be a really big time of change and new opportunities what did Toby and John give you as parents? What did they give me? Yeah. They gave me a great friendship. Uh, being raised by John and Toby, it wasn't this weird, you know, parent-child dynamic. We were best friends. They treated both Lulu and me like equals. I, that's one of the reasons that we call them John and Toby and not mom and dad. Because it's like, oh, I'm just calling like my friend to come over. Um, straight from the beginning, especially in the filmmaking process, they've allowed Lulu and me to have equal input in, in the storyline and you know what, we, what kind of uh, film we want to make. Which has taught me that, yeah, you know what? I, my opinion matters, even though I'm you know, 30 years younger than my parents. So I'm so grateful that they've raised us in that way. And I think it's really sculpted Lulu and me into the people that we are now. Mm. Thus far in your life, Zelda, what has been your biggest leap of faith where you had to step out and you didn't know what was going to be there, but you did it anyway and trusted that it was all going to be good? You know what? I think my biggest leap of faith is right now. I'm about to go off to school in uh, six days. and. Mm. I am feeling excited, nervous, scared. Um, I'm, it's a whirlwind of feelings. And I think I'm just going through a really big transition right now. Um, going to school and not making films with my parents anymore and, you know, not having their friendship instantly, like physically right by my side is going to be really, really different. So it's a big leap right now and I'm excited for it. You're going to have to come back and tell us how that leap goes. I, I think it's going to be a beautiful leap for you. <laughs> Thank you so much. I'd, I'll, I'll let you know. <laughs> let us know. I have one last question for you, Zelda. Right now on this show for this season, we are talking to people and asking them about how they have found their voice in the world, their place in the world. And if they have, or if they're discovering that, what they want to say with the platform they have, with their voice. And I ask you that same question. Have you found your voice in the world? And what, what do you want to say with it? I think I've found some of my voice as a filmmaker. Mm -hmm. And my goal with this voice is to just make other people feel heard and you know represented. Um, and I think a fun little way of doing that is through these horror films. You know, it's a weird way of for people to find parallels, but I think it's a fun way and, you know, a way for people to explore who they want to be and their dreams. And I'm also excited to explore new voices and new ways to help people feel heard and seen. Mm, you're going to have that very soon at Columbia. <laughs> Thank you. I, I'm excited. 
I cannot wait. I cannot wait to watch your journey through that. It's gonna it's gonna be beautiful. Thank Zelda, you. thank you so much for your time today. I'm so grateful that you sat down with me and, and just shared a window into your amazing life and was you were so open to these questions and to just sharing your story. I'm I'm so grateful. So thank you for that. Patrick, thank you for these incredible questions that I've never been asked before. So it really made me think. And so I really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you so much, Zelda. And to those of you who are watching or listening, remember, we all have a voice. So use yours wisely. Bye, everyone. Thank you, Zelda.